Yeah, it's one o'clock here, so one it's not too bad. Not too bad. You look you you look pretty chipper for one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay, it is seven oh one, so and it looks like we have the majority of people here. A few might tumble Excellent. in. But I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and. Okay. Sounds like everybody's on mute, but uh, welcome everybody. I'm Matt Wolf. I'm with Columbus Outdoor Pursuits and uh, welcome to uh, this inspired by the fire series that we've been doing for a number of weeks now to provide a little bit of en entertainment and community uh, through the winter months here. You know, a lot of us have not been able to get out and do the things we normally do. So this is one way for us to kind of stay connected as an outdoor community. And um, I, um, I'm pleased to have online with me uh, the presenter tonight, uh, Robert Schwartz, who is, uh, is based in Southern Germany right now, uh, which is his home territory. But I met Robert um, about 25 years ago. Robert and I were uh, lucky enough to be uh, on a winter over team at South Pole Station in, in Antarctica in 1996-97. Um, and that was a, both our first year at the South Pole. And so um, <clears throat> I spent a year there with him, uh, not only through the summer months, the Austral summer, but we were on the winter over team. So we stayed on with 26 other people. There was a total of 28 of us who stayed on and sort of kept the lights on and the science projects running. I was the staff meteorologist. Robert was an astrophysicist. Um, and the uh, fun thing about Robert is that he has gone on to spend a total of 15 winters at the South Pole, um, which I think by far is, is more than anyone in human history, and he can probably speak more to that. So he is the real deal. Um, you know, if you're... <laughs> When I thought about having a subject matter expert for how to dress for cold, I thought, what none better than him? Because I often remembered him out dressed up, trying to keep his camera warm, not only himself, taking pictures of the Aurora Australis. And he's going to share some of those as well. Um, he's really had uh, quite, he's, he's amassed quite a collection over the years. So it's my pleasure to introduce Robert. I'm going to turn it over to him for a few minutes, and then we're going to go back to a, a video that I'm going to open up with. And I'm going to play that video for about five minutes. It'll give you a good overview of what the South Pole is about, where it's located, and, and sort of what it's like to be there and live there. So Robert, did you want to say a few opening words? Yeah, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to um, talk to you today. Um, about dressing in the cold. Um, people always ask if you get used to the cold. You don't really get used to the cold, but you get definitely used to get dressed properly. And you do that very quickly. And it takes less than a minute normally to get ready to go outside. And un unless in summertime or during our first winter and dome days, we would walk in t-shirts between the buildings, even in the middle of the winter. If you go outside, you definitely have to dress properly, otherwise you will regret it very quickly. Matt, you're muted. I am muted. I'm gonna start now by sharing my screen with a very good opening video. Robert and I talked about this and, and he pointed out this video. And I really do, do think it gives, gives us a really great overview a, a, of what it's like to be at the South Pole and work there. So I'm going to share my screen for about five minutes and then I'll come back and we'll, we'll start talking with Robert again about how to dress at the poll and, and we'll work into his presentation. Of course, at any time, if you have questions, this is casual enough that you can just take your mute off, pipe up and ask. So
Are we supposed to be seeing something? I think he's working on it. <laughs> gotcha. That's the effect if you want to present something. It worked fine per before. What's the problem, Matt? You are muted too, so we can't hear you what you're saying. He's swearing. Oh, okay. <laughs> As of lip readers. <laughs> which for most people isn't high enough to be deadly, but is enough to potentially lead to sickness, which could elevate the severity. Is this working? No, we only hear it, but we don't see it. Try again, sorry about that. We did have success earlier and I apologize for the problem. I'm gonna back up, reshare the screen and hopefully we'll go again. Share screen. Nothing yet. Sure. Now it goes. Yeah. Thank you. Continuously inhabited by humans. In fact, it's safe to say that there's nowhere on Earth with such a large population, about 45 in the winter and 150 in the summer, where nature is so constantly working to kill you. The warmest it's ever been at the pole in recorded history is just 10 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 12 degrees Celsius, a temperature that most of the world would consider absolutely unbearable while most of the year is spent at 50 or 60 below zero. But it's not just temperature that gives the pole its extreme classification. It's also one of the driest places on Earth, with a relative humidity regularly dipping to 0.03%. In comparison, most places' humidity hovers between 55 and 75 percent, meaning that those at the South Pole are constantly battling skin and body dehydration. In addition to all that, due to the thousands of feet of ice and snow layered on top of the ground below, the pole is located at around 9,300 feet or 2,800 meters above sea level, which for most people isn't high enough to be deadly, but is enough to potentially lead to sickness which could elevate the severity of other conditions. Put together, these factors compound to paint a pretty clear picture. The South Pole was not made for humans, but nonetheless, through sheer force of will, we're there permanently. What makes this possible is the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. This American-run facility is now in its third iteration. The first was built in 1956 as a simple, wooden, prefabricated structure that quickly became buried by snow. This was upgraded in 1974 to a larger geodesic dome that itself protected buildings inside, and this too was buried by snow each winter, meaning that each summer, considerable time and fuel had to be used to dig the station out. In a place where absolutely everything has to be flown in, this was an enormous expense that got in the way of the science. Therefore, in the years leading up to the turn of the millennia, the United States Antarctic Program worked to develop a more permanent solution. And that solution was this. Now, this current structure is undoubtedly distinctive, but its design comes with good reason. The building itself is shaped like an airplane wing, with a leading edge facing the prevailing winds. This pushes air down, accelerating it underneath the facility, which naturally clears out the snow. As most of Antarctica is a desert, only about 8 inches or 20 centimeters of snow per year accumulates at the South Pole, but as the temperature quite literally never goes above freezing, the snow never melts. In addition, since the landscape surrounding the pole is quite flat and the winds are strong, enormous snow banks quickly form on the upwind side of any building. While the shape of the main station building reduces this, snow still does accumulate in front and under it. 
Therefore, it's designed so that, every 10 to 15 years, the structure will be raised up a few feet. This is a 30-day process, which can only happen over the three-month summer period when the station can be reached by plane, meaning that in order to not shut down the facility during its busiest period, the building was designed to be operational while it's lifted. Therefore, its different components are connected by a number of flexible joints that can move during the lifting process. Of course, the actual purpose of the station is for research, but that poses the question, what sort of research do you actually need to be at the South Pole for? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. One of the top uses is for astronomy. You see, in most places, water vapor in the air ever so slightly distorts the image from telescopes, which for most types of astronomy isn't a problem, but when one is trying to observe galaxies billions of light years away, for example, precision is key. In fact, the South Pole Telescope itself has discovered truly countless far away galaxies. In addition, thanks to this clarity, it was a crucial component of the planet-wide network of telescopes that created the first ever direct image of a black hole in 2019. Beyond that, the clean air of the pole allows for super-precise atmospheric research, and the relatively low annual accumulation allows for climate research through studying ice cores. This is all to say, the South Pole Station isn't just there for prestige. It's a critical piece of scientific infrastructure supporting a huge variety of research. However, most of the research itself isn't actually conducted there. Given how expensive it is to travel to the pole, various institutions generally only send a small number of people to the station to calibrate and maintain their scientific equipment, while the data are sent back to their respective headquarters for analysis. That means that, each summer, in that three-month window when flights can land, there's a flurry of activity as personnel try to get all their work done before the season is over. Then, over winter, only a skeleton crew remains to keep everything running. Of course, given the absolute isolation that occurs over this period, the station staff is very carefully selected. Everyone is screened to assure that they're in near-perfect physical health, as conditions that might be minor in the rest of the world can turn deadly given the station's lack of advanced medical care, and they're also subject to extensive psychological evaluation. This is primarily to assure that they can handle the severe degree of isolation, six months of continuous darkness, and small work community for nine months, as, if mental health deteriorates over winter, there's truly no way out. Okay. Well, who wants to go? <laughs> Robert, it's nice to know that we were in near perfect physical health at one time. <laughs> That's right, yes. So I'll turn it over to you now, and I know you have some slides prepared, but um, I think this probably gives people a pretty good overview. So just I'm going to mute myself and turn this over to Robert. Thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Hope it works better. Can you see it? Perfect. So just again, a quick reminder, we are right here at the geographic South Pole, 90 degrees South, we fly in, we are McMurdo from New Zealand, New Zealand is somewhere down here. So just a commercial flight to Christchurch, New Zealand, and then military flights to McMurdo, it's about um, five and a half to nine hours, depending which plane you get. And then it's another three hours flight from McMurdo to the South Pole on a ski-equipped Hercules transport plane. And as you can see, it can get quite chilly there. Um, the lowest temperature I, exper I experienced was um, also actually in my first winter with Matt, was minus 80.4 centigrade, or um, just around um, minus 110 Fahrenheit, and that's ambient temperature, as you can see, the wind chill is quite a bit more severe, and also the altitude is um, quite high. But um, I mean, that is like um, a really cold day, but still the yearly average is minus 49 
centigrade, which is, uh, Matt, what is it in Fahrenheit? Well, that would be about minus 50 Fahrenheit is your yearly average, so I always... Minus 40, is, 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 so it should be minus um, 60 Fahrenheit, because minus 40 is a meat Fahrenheit and um, yes. centigrade, so about minus 60 Fahrenheit is a annual average temperature there. So when you, here's another um, temperature graph. You can see it's, um, I made that from the weather data in 2002, 2003. And you can see quite a bit of a variation even um, during the austral winter when it's dark for six months, the sun doesn't get above the horizon and you think it should be pretty cold all the time. But even there you can have temperature jumps and um, minus 40 degrees in winter time actually seems warm and you will run around with an open parka. And um, as you can see on the little wiggles, it can happen quite often. And um, temperature jumps of 30 degree Fahrenheit uh, within 24 hours is actually not rare. It can happen quite often, just depending if the wind shifts and it comes from another, another direction you go out to work in the morning and the team is really chilly, close to minus 90, minus 100 Fahrenheit. And then the wind shifts and like a few, eight hours later, you go back to the station and suddenly it's like quite a bit warm. I think, wow, you open your parka when you walk out. But um, here's a little um, guide what you wear. So inside the station, of course, it's normally warm and you just wear um, normal clothes, like uh, kind of a jeans, t-shirt, sweatshirt over it. And then you start with like car hats, insulated pants, but actually not very thick, just a normal standard work pants. You can also get in the States. You have some bigger boots. Then um, the weak points are like your hands and your head. Everything else is actually um, quite good. So you start out with some um, the first um, balaclava, another one that kind of protects your throat a bit more. Then a big down parka. Another head on top. And I had my own face mask because I had the problem like when I was breathing out and um, it that just doesn't fog up your glasses. It immediately freezes on your glasses because the glasses are cold enough. So I made a little face mask with a little snorkel where I was breathing in and out, the outside air directly. And that uh, worked actually quite well. Then during winter time, you have clear goggles in summertime, some with tinted glasses, and then three pairs of gloves, a thin one. Um, sometimes you have to take off the big mittens if you have to work on um, some small stuff, then some, wool mittens over it and some big fur mittens. And then if it's really windy, you put your hood up as well. And that's actually all already there is. So it's actually not so much as you might expect for this temperatures compared to what you have in, inside, but um, you definitely get used to um, get dressed to it and also quickly. And here's a picture of me outside actually um, in the ground shield of my telescope. Robert. Um, all the years down there, I was working for um, various telescopes. First, it was a telescope bird in the eyes looking for neutrinos, subatomic particles that are created with every atomic reaction. And then okay. later on, I had um, two microwave telescopes I took care of, and we were looking at the afterglow of the Big Bang. So the farthest signal we can see in space and here you can see me outside on the walk to the dark sector. So the dark sector is about half a mile away from the station and it's called dark sector because we want to keep it radio dark and also light dark because we have light sensitive experiments and also like just the radio noise of walkie talkies and um, satellite connection and all that interferes with our instruments. I mean, if you look 13.8 billion years into the past and you detect something the telescope has to be quite sensitive and also picks up if somebody keys the radio um, around the building. So we want to avoid that and that's what's called the dark sector. 
But one of the best things about being at the South Pole is the uh, auroras. And just walking back and forth um, between the telescope and the station, that was my daily commute. And I would say it's one of the best commutes on Earth. Yeah, that's a, a view in the other direction, the station in the background. Um, here during moonlight, so it's dark for six months. The sun is uh, sets um, 21st of March, and then it rises again 23rd of September. So six months you are without the sun, and it takes about um, four weeks. Uh, like the twilight, it takes about an hour back home. It takes about four weeks down there, and it's four weeks, uh, four months totally dark. And then you have four weeks of twilight again for sunrise. But every two weeks, the moon comes up for two weeks. And then it sets again for two weeks. So um, after you spend already two weeks in the dark, the moon can be quite bright. And especially if you do long time exposures, um, it looks like daylight. But um, the auroras are definitely just the auroras are worth going down there. and. Um, we are right on the inside of the most active auroral zone, the so-called aurora oval. And so most of the time we always have some aurora. So if you, in the course of 24 hours, um, you have a good chance if the weather is good enough, you always see some kind of auroras and if it's dark enough. Here's another picture of the geographic South Pole right in the back. You see a little post here. That is the actual geographic South Pole, 90 degrees South. It, um, we are sitting on a big glacier, so actually the ice moves with about 30 feet per year. So every 1st of January is the new exact South Pole. The South Pole, of course, is fixed, but then the ice moves on top of it, 30 um, feet roughly per year. And so every 1st of January, the exact pole is determined, and then a new marker is placed there and the sign. And um, Maybe another interesting story um, for that is um, when the temperature drops below minus 100 Fahrenheit, we have a little sauna, we heat up to over 200 Fahrenheit. And then the temperature difference from inside to outside is over 300 Fahrenheit. And um, so we stay in the sauna until we can't stand it anymore. And then we run outside only with shoes on and we run one time around the geographic South Pole and we have a difference of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we become a member of the 300 club. <laughs> but here are some uh, more pictures of the absolutely beautiful auroras and the night sky. You see here's a Milky Way. And um, the nice thing for astronomy at the South Pole is, um, it's very easy for the mount because uh, except moon, sun, and the planets, nothing rises or sets. Every star stays exactly the same elevation all year round because we're right at the geographic South Pole. And here you can see the center of the Milky Way. Um, here is a Scorpio, Sagittarius here, and uh, it's an absolutely beautiful view. Also, if you look straight up, um, a lot of times I was uh, right above us and we get a so-called corona when it looks like um, the, corona, uh, the aurora is right above us and it all seems to go to one point. It's actually parallel lines and it's the same effect like if you would stand on railway tracks, they look like they meet in the distance, but of course you hope they're parallel, especially if you ride the train. And um, that's the same thing with the uh, auroras and you can see two little fuzzy spots here. That's the large and the small Magellanic cloud. Besides the Andromeda galaxy, that's the uh, three items you can see with the naked eye that don't belong to our own Milky Way. So this one is um, the large Magellanic cloud is about 160,000 light years away and the small Magellanic cloud about 200,000 light years away. So pretty much twice the diameter of our own Milky Way. So small irregular galaxies gravitationally bound to our own Milky Way. So they still quite close compared to the Andromeda galaxy, which is about 2.2 million light years away. But um, they are very close to the Southern celestial pole. So um, being at the geographic south was a good vantage point. Here's an image um, of a very, very bright aurora. 
And most of the time, if you see auroras um, at night, our eyes are very bad looking at colors or uh, distinguishing colors. And um, we have a saying for that in German, at night, all cats are gray. So um, if it's dark, you don't really, you basically pretty much see only gray scales. But, um, and that also is also true for a lot of the auroras. They look kind of whitish, but once in a while you get this really big aurora outbreaks and um, it looks re really colorful to, even to the naked eye. And um, that picture is one of, one of those outbreaks. The exposure time of that picture is less than one second. Of course, the camera sensitivity is quite high, but it's amazing and you can see uh, um, the movement and also a rule of thumb, as bright as they are, as fast as they move. And I already talked to Matt, he will send out um, two links, um, one to a Vimeo page, I have over 50 videos on it, and uh, you're welcome to have a look at them. And there's also some real-time footage on it. Here a picture of auroras above the ceremonial pole, um, there are the 12 flags that first signed the Antarctic Treaty. And um, so that's uh, the ceremonial pole. And then we have the actual geographic pole. A few to the other side, the station, which is now, or which was um, our home. Um, over here is a galley, pretty much the main area. Then here is computer rooms and stuff, science offices. Um, conference rooms um, and uh, so communication rooms. And then to the back of the station are all the rooms and we also have a small gym. Here again, a picture of the ceremonial pole. And a picture from the dark sector to the station. And so we don't get lost because that could be deadly in this environment. We have a flag line between the station and all the outbuildings, a flag probably every um, 15 feet. So even in stormy conditions, we are able to find our way back to the station. And um, as long as you walk with this clothing, as long as you move around outside, it's no problem to stay outside for an hour. Um, one of our least favorite tasks is shoveling snow, but we have to do it quite a lot. Um, you heard the snow accumulation is not very much, but that is if there's nothing there, there's no obstacle there. But if you build a building, which is an obstacle and it breaks the wind, you have a lot of snow accumulation. Um, you can have um, many feet in the course of a storm of a day, and then you have to shovel out the building. That was my laboratory for all the 15 winters. I was down there for all three different experiments I attended. And originally it was about 15 feet above the ground. And now it's like in a dip and it has to be dug out every year. And a storm it will just deposit a lot of snow in front of the door. And you have to do a lot of shoveling. And normally you don't get called, maybe your hands get cold. If you walk, uh, work out uh, long enough outside, your goggles will freeze up and you have to go inside because of that. But as long as you move around, walk around, it's actually quite good and you don't really get cold. Also, um, so the main auroras are normally the green and red, but once in a while, especially like if it's close to sunrise or after sunset and the sun still hits the upper atmosphere, you also get a lot of the pink and bluish auroras. That's, a diff that's nitrogen. The green and red is um, mainly atomic oxygen that's getting excited. So what the auroras are, it's basically charged particles from the sun, mainly electrons that um, fly into space. And um, if something is on the way, like the Earth, um, the particles um, hit the, our magnetic field and they can't penetrate the magnetic field directly, but they kind of follow the magnetic field lines like beads on a string to the poles. And there they enter the atmosphere and they excite um, atoms and molecules in our atmosphere. So all that happens between um, roughly um, 40 to 300 miles above the ground with the most activity roughly about 100 
miles above the ground and excite the atoms. And these atoms don't want to stay in this excited state. They want to give off that excess energy they got because of the, uh, they've been hit by an electron. And the easiest way to get rid of that excess energy is in form of light. Pretty much the same you have in every fluorescent light bulb. You have a thin gas and you put high voltage on and there's electrons rushing through and they hit the atoms in that fluorescent bulb and they excite them and they give off light. Just the auroras are much nicer than a fluorescent tube. Up here you also have the Southern Cross. And here's Alva and Beta Centauri. Here's only Alpha Centauri. Um, And once in a while, like every two weeks, you get the moon, which is then already a little bit of light pollution. You can't enjoy the dark night sky as much. And here's another nice image of a CME that stands for coronary of mass ejection we had in 2015. And we had like pretty much a big aurora storm for more or less than 40 hours. So coronal mass ejection is a little bit more than the normal particles um, spoon into space by the sun. It's like a massive outbreak on the sun. And if that flies towards the earth, then um, there's a good chance for really, really good auroras. There's also a good chance that you will destroy some satellites because suddenly there's so much particle flux in, the, in outer space. Astronauts are not allowed to go on spacewalks on, and so on, but um, the auroras are a very nice effect of that. Some more pictures of the ceremonial pole. It's quite a different variety of auroras. And um, since we are so close to the main aurora activity zones, aurora oval, sometimes you have the auroras over the whole sky. You don't even know where to look first, and it's only like a um, fish eye image where you can see the whole horizon um, gives you a good respect of the auroras. You see nicely again the Milky Way, the two Magellanic clouds, and here's the Southern Cross. And here's Alpha and Beta Centauri. So Alpha Centauri is our next neighbors, neighboring star. That's only 4.3 light years away from us. So that's the closest star to the sun. And of course, since we are at the pole, if you do like um, a star trail for 24 hours, you get, of course, whole circles. And it's really, they're all concentric to the horizon. And the geographic or the celestial pole is right in the zenith from us. And here's another um, interesting picture that was um, a lunar eclipse we had in 2018. So that is the eclipsed moon and that is Mars above it. And here again, you have the Milky Way in Scorpio. And um, as you already heard, why we are down there, because um, it's an excellent spot for science. For microwave astronomy, it's the best place on Earth that is uh, accessible in the moment. There's another place in Antarctica, which is um, about a thousand meters, like 3,000 feet higher than the South Pole, but there's no stations there yet. So in the um, so far, it's like it's um, hard to be there, especially for the winter. But um, South Pole, with all the infrastructure, is a perfect place um, for microwave astronomy where any water vapor will disturb your vision. And so because it's so cold and so dry, that is why we are there. So next uh, best step or uh, better step would be in space, flying experiments on a satellite, but that is much more expensive and has a lot of other um, problems as well. Besides astronomy, there's a lot of other science going on. Um, seismic, um, all the atmospheric measurements here, the balloon launch for the ozone um, balloons, NOAA launches, um, especially then towards uh, sunrise. Like every few days, they launch a balloon to measure the extent of the ozone layer and the ozone hole. 
Yeah, a couple of more pictures. And here's another um, picture maybe to show um, the distribution between daylight and darkness at pole. So as I said, like 21st of March is the sunset. Then you have about 15 days of civil twi twilight. That's when the sun is between uh, zero and six degrees below the horizon, the nautical twilight six to 12 degrees below the horizon. And you would normally say already, yeah, towards 5th of April, it's pretty dark. You would definitely turn your lights on um, to see the first stars will come out. And um, nautical twilight, you basically have enough stars, but you still have a good horizon definition. So if you want to use a sextant, what's it used to do on boats? Um, that's how nautical twilight is um, defined. And then astronomical twilight, it's definitely for every normal being, it's totally dark, but you might have not the perfect a night sky condition you might need for some of us uh, from of the astronomy and then you're yeah, definitely uh, totally dark here and then you have the different stages but up to here is like um where it's pretty much then totally you would call it definitely totally dark and it takes about four weeks what takes an hour um, back home and then the sun comes up and it um doesn't get much warmer right away. It takes like um, from sunrise 23rd of September, it takes about until early November until the temperatures really start rising and you feel a, a good effect. And that's also why the station opens uh, normally for the big uh, planes, the Hercules, um, early November, because they can only land when it's warmer than minus 50 centigrade. And here's a picture of um, our first winter. Here you can see Matt, and here you can see me. And it's all the 28 of us. Um, the first um, winter we were still in the dome. The new station was uh, um, existed only on the board, but um, the start of the new station basically began after our first winter. They started to. Um, um, do the first um, um, construction work for the new station, which took about 10 years to construct because you can only do outside work pretty much during the three months of summer. And um, that's already that. the end of that small um, presentation. So about um, getting dressed and some impressions of the auroras and like your as i said like the the weak points are basically your hands and your face and everybody comes up with its own um solution for their face some people um, don't put goggles on because they fog up so they just have like a little slit in the balaclava and the hood um for me it was too uncomfortable so i always had to wear my my goggles but then I had the problem because I'm wearing glasses. So I had basically three surfaces where my breast could freeze on. So I had to make this little face mask with a little snorkel where I could um, breathe the outside air in and out. And you might think, oh, breathing air in with minus 100 Fahrenheit is also not good. And that is true, but it also depends how you breathe. If you inhale like that or if you inhale like that, there's a big difference. And um, it's true, like if it's so cold and you would run outside and you would make deep breath, you would freeze your lung. Your body won't be able to uh, warm up uh, the air. And like um, in 96, when we did this 300 club and we were running to the pole, it was quite far. <laughs> and um, so we thought we, we should run and we were breathing and Everything was fine, but then we would cough like for two days, like we just smoked two packs of Marlboros because we all froze our lungs basically. And uh, <laughs> Robert, I was wondering if you could spend a little time talking about the importance of the hood. You know, what much like the Eskimos wear the hood on your 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 coat. Yeah, so um, uh, for the Eskimos, like they have the fur, and apparently it should stimulate the skin a little bit when it's um, 
to keep it um, warm. I mean, I never really had the effect. I only put the hood up if there was really nasty wind because my face was anyway covered. But um, so that's um, probably the worst thing is, is wind. Cold temperatures, if, you, if you're dressed, it's no problem at all. It's nice to stay outside. But um, so I would rather prefer minus 100 uh, with barely any wind than minus 50 with 20 knots of wind. I mean, any, any given day, I would prefer that. So the cold itself is not, not so bad, but the wind makes it nasty. And um, you can feel it like um, you have one side of your face, you're walking out to the dark sector and the wind is coming from this direction and you feel really uh, like that face is getting cold and you put your hood up to just shield you against the wind. But as yeah, the Eskimos, I mean, they normally have the fur color and it's also like, um, I guess you can make it quite narrow, but you still see a little bit through the fur. So you don't have only this tunnel vision if you just have a solid hood. So there's different uh, explanations for it. But um, I mean, I put the hood up only during, uh, during the worst wind. We have a question. Was the material, the material for the baklava, was it wool or were they synthetic? And uh, I think that's in, synthetic. Yeah, it's just like, I mean, so I had, um, for the face mask I wear, I had actually uh, three different ones. Um, one fleece one for summer, which was um, not so um, warm. And then for winter time, I had actually one with uh, windstopper in it and um, always another hat on top of it. So that worked quite well. And um, the worst one was just uh, basically the gloves, your hands, especially if you had to work outside. You had the three pairs of gloves, but a lot of things um, like, for example, your telescope, you had to do some outside work on your telescope and somebody built it in a nice high bay in a, at a university at a room temperature. And they used a lot of small screws and stuff. And you try to take a small wrench in your hand and it just vanishes in the big glove. You, and you can't really um, hold it very well. So you have to take basically all the big gloves off when you only have your small finger gloves. And um, I mean, then the wrench also has already minus 80, minus 90 Fahrenheit and you touch it and it's metal and it, you definitely feel it. And um, also taking pictures, I, I mean, yeah, I frost by a bit all my fingers a lot of times, especially during my early years when I was still doing slides and, and anybody who did long exposure um, slide photography or uh, uh, analog photography, you know, you had this little wire to hold your, your shutter open and there was a little metal screw and you try to work that also with your, your gloves. So that was um, quite hard. And later on, once you had digital cameras, it was much easier because you could just build a electric um, remote control and you could use any switch you and you could use a big switch you can easily operate with mittens and there was no problem with that. Robert, I'd like to open it up to questions now and just give folks a chance to, to ask you about anything they want. You've covered a lot of material here. And uh, so if you if anybody has any questions, unmute yourself and, and ask Robert. I can go. I can I can start. Certainly, first of all, thank you for those incredible pictures of the Aurora Borealis. Th those were phenomenal. Uh, just, uh, just what, what a great share that was. Uh, in, in practicality, I want to talk about uh, people uh, wearing the right things and the wrong things and getting cold uh, or maybe getting too hot underneath all that kind of stuff. Um, I've heard of a common mistake, um, and did this ever happen to you or people with you, where they put like too many socks on so that it re reduces the circulation in the foot so that their feet actually freeze faster? Is there any uh, thought about making sure there's dead air space in those incredible uh, boots to make sure that there's uh, there, there's uh, warm air circulation from uh, uh, regular body heat? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, mm -hmm. common mistakes that are made. You can do the same thing with your hands. You put too much to, to you, you reduce the circulation in your hands if you've got too much on there and you're restricting yep. the airflow. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's definitely true. Like, um, especially like for, for boots, which uh, um, you don't want to have too many socks on. 
-hmm. and um, the boots are quite huge. I mean, they're also quite heavy and um, you have one pair of um, socks, uh, some depending on which kind of boots, there's also the bunny boot, uh, which the um, military uses as well. And they have actually a little airspace inside. They are rubber boots with uh, they have a little valve and you can pump air in it or you can okay. release the air like if you're on the plane you don't want them to like if they if oh, there's yeah. less pressure yeah. and they, they will expand and they will also be, be quite uncomfortable so you have a little valve to to release pressure there and yeah. um but that's a thing like you have like some some air as insulation yeah. and of course you have a big um sole on the bottom with like an probably another extra felt liner because yeah. the ground is always cold. It's always around minus 50 or minus 60 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. It's definitely true, like for your, your, your hands as well. You don't want to restrict them too much. And also, mm -hmm. one thing um, what we use a lot is like this um, chemical hand warmers. Yeah. yeah. You're Those probably all uh, familiar with. And yeah. um, it's a great thing they work with oxygen in the air. So if you um, put them like in a small Ziploc bag, they're normally good for eight hours or so, roughly. But um, I mean, it's a waste if you just go out for <clears throat> 15 minutes until you're in your lab again. And then on eight hours later, you want to go back and you have to use another pair. So we just put them in small Ziploc bags and they are good for pretty much a week because if you use it okay. only like um, an hour a day, it's um, it works um, quite well, and that's a, a big thing that you can just basically, even in your mittens, you can you have them here and on in your hand, and you can just pull your fingers back from your gloves and you yeah. warm your fingers up. That's a great tip. That that really is a great tip. Now, how about wearing a too much, getting too hot, and then the the then your sweat freezes. Yeah, up. That's, that's exactly that's another big thing. You um. If you know you're outside, you never really want to sweat. That's 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 yeah. really bad. I mean, if you, especially if you don't have a chance to go back inside. I mean, at the pole, it's also so we never far away from a building, especially during winter time. We don't wander off into mm -hmm. the endlessness of the Antarctic plateau. I mean, pretty much in within half a mile, more or less, there's always a building. So mm -hmm. if you feel like oh, you, I really sweat now and um, you stop what you're doing right now and you're not sweating so much, you, you better make sure that you get back into a building and change. Mm -hmm. But if you know you will be outside for a while, especially in summertime where it's not so cold, I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. a hot summer day is still quite a bit be below freezing, mm -hmm. but uh, we definitely want to make sure that you're not, um, uh, that you're not sweat too much. And like the onion layer principle, you're all, all familiar with this also works down there very well and you might when you start out working you rather want to be a bit cold and then warm up than being too warm and getting sweaty and that is very um, counterproductive and actually worse than starting out a little bit cold I mean same when you go on hikes or so when I go into the mountains I mean you get out of your car or whatever you start in the morning from your hut or whatever you, you want to be actually a bit colder and so you don't have to change every yeah. five minutes. But then again, it's, it's good if you can change or like even like open your jacket and not wait until you're really sweaty and um, be like um, already proactive in that. Yeah, and then you can get really cold. Yeah, you know, and, and certainly I've been known to take a, a, a change. Uh, so if you're, if, if when you stop hiking and you put up your tent, you know, you get in, the, get, get, get in and change into a dry uh, underlayer. Yeah. Uh, so that you don't, uh, so so that that has a chance to dry, and also you don't get too cold, uh, because isn't that doesn't that isn't that uh, a, a cause of hypothermia that having having that cold layer next to your skin when you yeah, start? Yeah, definitely. And it's yeah. like, uh, I mean, the the problem with the hypothermia pole is again, um, if under normal conditions you don't really get it. I mean, what you definitely feel like, oh. Shit, it's really cold. I can't feel my hands anymore, and you go inside. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean we never away so much, but the um, danger is like if something happens, you have an accident or you get lost. Yeah. Then you're definitely very quickly yeah. prone to to hypothermia. That's dangerous, dangerous stuff. Yeah. Well, if you do the 300 club and you're only in your birthday suit out, I mean, <laughs> then you're not staying too long. <laughs> you well, definitely don't want to get lost in that circumstances. <laughs> 
as as a as a Finnish American, I'm just delighted to hear that you love your sauna. <laughs> <laughs> and you put it and you put it to good use <laughs> i mean it's like yeah the sauna is um, really a big asset there and it's uh, it's used quite a lot yeah i mean sometimes you even feel you come in and you feel just chilly and you just um go into the sauna it's normally always like on a on a small heat yeah it's like just a nice place to warm up and you even go in as so you, you take your big clothes off but you wear your normal inside clothes and you just sit in the sauna for a few minutes and, and warm up again and um, so that's also nice and also another thing is um, of course we have um, pretty much all the fresh water on the earth down there but it's frozen so oh. to use it we have to melt it mm. and um, pretty much all our water for usage is melted with the ex uh, like the heat from the generators so it's mm. a heat exchanger and we melt ice with that but it only gives us a certain amount of, of, of water. So if we use more water, we have to use precious fuel for it. And so mm. we try to avoid that. And so um, we have basically a limitation of two two minute showers per week and one load of laundry. Mm. Might sound terrible at the first, but because it's so dry, you don't even wanna shower every day because your skin is like, just doesn't like it and even yeah. After, if you shower only twice a week, like you come out of the shower and it feels like, oh, like a snake that has, has yeah. to um, yeah. change its skin. You have oh. to put lotion on. Yeah. yeah. And so like um, just a two minute shower, it's not really much to, to warm up really. Like if you think, oh, I want to have a nice hot shower. I mean, two minutes are not really long enough for that. So a yeah. lot of times we just go into the sauna <laughs> For 15 minutes, warm up, and then we take our shower. Yeah. It's yeah. much more comfortable. Yeah. We're going to open it up now to see if anyone else has questions, um, particularly about, you know, dressing for the cold or recreating outside. I know Robert's done a number. He's been uh, done some mountaineering himself. Um, he hasn't only been at the pole over the last 25 years. So I'll just let it open now before... We have about 10 minutes, seven minutes till eight, and we'll try to close this up at eight o'clock. You spoke about uh, wearing two pairs of gloves inside of uh, mittens. Um, I wear some merino wool, wool gloves inside of wool mittens, inside of deerskin mittens mm -hmm. to uh, ride my bicycle in the winter, my thumbs get cold. And you, you, you spoke about uh, some kind of a chemical thing that you that you've kept in a plastic bag and was not exposed. Yeah, so like this is chemical hand warmers you can buy. They, uh, um, it's a small um, kind of clothes bag, like, uh, and they are packed in, in, in plastic, airtight. And once you open it and you expose them to oxygen, yeah. So basically all it's in there is like some active charcoal, mm -hmm. some iron powder, and like with the moisture in the air, it gives a chemical reaction that produces heat, but it's not reversible. So there's some other hand warmers that you can also are reversible, but these ones are not. Mm -hmm. But once you um, stop the access to oxygen, like you put it on a small Ziploc bag or so, they kind of cool off again, and then you can reuse them. Otherwise, mm -hmm. once you open them up, um, they will last for six to eight hours, but then mm -hmm. you basically have to, to throw them away. And they are yeah. flexible, so that makes it quite good. And um, also for the gloves, like um, in summertime, a lot of times we use skidoos, and they have the thumb throttle. Yeah. And yeah, like your thumb definitely gets cold, so sometimes we just put another hand warmer in the big mittens right where your thumb is to, to keep your, yeah. um, your thumb warm. Yeah, well, if they last for six or eight days, I, I only, uh, or six to eight hours, that, that would last me one week. Yeah, that's what we, that's what I did. Like, mm -hmm. I always put them in because I never knew if I would take pictures if I go out and it was just more, more comfortable, especially in wintertime. During summertime, I didn't need it. But in wintertime, just to have that extra warmth at your hands was quite comfortable. And um, the walk from the station to the telescope took me 15 minutes, but wasn't hold up by taking pictures of the auroras. And um, then I just put them in a small Ziploc bag and so we cool off. And then in the evening I've used them again. And so, yeah, I could use them for a week, up to a week. 
Mm -hmm. Robert, we have another question that came up on chat. It said, aside from the South Pole, where have you spent the most uncomfortable cold time in your career? <laughs> okay, um, I can definitely say even after 15 winters at the South Pole, I never was so cold and was freezing so much as the two years I was in the army. Uh, just remember lying somewhere in a foxhole in the snow with wet clothes the whole night. Yeah, that was very uncomfortable. Mm. And, um, and that was in Germany. So, and uh, I mean, we get some winters with um, quite a bit below freezing. And my basic training was in winter time. And I definitely remember, like I always say, I, the two years in the army, I was definitely freezing more often than my whole time at the South Pole. The hard part about being in foxholes or in the, out in the cold like that is you have to go to the bathroom because yeah. the fluids go through your fat body faster, and that's 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 trouble. <laughs> yeah, we always uh, make the joke at South Pole: it's hard to pee outside if you have so much insulation and it's only such a yeah. long pipe. So, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that brings up another thing about uh, um, making sure that you're properly hydrated. Uh, um, isn't that part of hypothermia? Uh, some people don't uh, feel yes. that they're thirsty. And so they don't drink enough water, so they they become sort of dehydrated, which in, exacerbates a hyperthermic condition. Is that that, that accurate? Yeah, I mean, like said, your whole um, basically body state, anything which kind of affects your your overall body performance. That if you don't have eaten enough, if you if you're thirsty, you don't have enough liquid in your body, everything kind of affects. Like anything, hypothermia comes to it, and it's much worse than if you would be properly um, hydrated. And uh, already because of the high altitude and the dry air, I mean, you have to drink a lot at yeah. the pole anyway. And um, I mean, you, as you saw on this little um, clip, I mean, the air is dry and that's the reason why we are down there. And it, it, you feel it on your hands, you feel it on your nose, like you're breathing, you get down there and after hours basically, all your sinuses are dried up and it will stay there for the, for the rest of, your, of the year. Mm. And um, so you, you definitely um, have to drink a lot just because of the humidity and you, you lose um, just with breathing. And once the air gets into your lungs, it's normally at body temperature and 100% humidity. So if it starts out with nearly zero humidity, you have to put a lot of humidity in with your body. Mm. If it, you're in a humid climate i mean yeah you don't have to put much in so yeah you have to drink a lot of how many liters a day do you think did you ever think about it did they tell you you must drink x amount of, of uh... I, I, say, I say recommend at least three liters that's but, i mean that's um i i actually drink anyway a lot so like three liters was easy for me i mean a lot of times i would drink four or five liters a day mm -hmm. Especially on a day where you would you do some sports, we have. Um, I mean, besides where we are, we have quite. We have a nice gym, which has a full size volleyball court. The so outside is not as big as regular regulation, and we have a weight room. But you you work out and uh, you go on the treadmill or so, and just I mean, breathing this dry air, you definitely feel it, and you have to drink a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else have any questions before we wrap it up tonight? I don't think so. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask one, uh, Robert. Uh, I found this fascinating. I found everything you talked about fascinating. But uh, one thing that uh, kind of uh, interests me was uh, you talked about how the uh, uh, the ice shelf uh, shifts. You know how it moves. I believe it was like thirty feet a year, and you have to change. You know where the marker is located for the South Pole. So at the same time, is the all your experiments and the station itself are they shifting too? And I guess over time, I guess you know, over say uh, 30, 40 years, you'd probably you know move like a quarter of a mile you know away from the actual South Pole. So do things have to you know um, be uh, moved around all the time in addition to that marker? No, it's actually only the marker is moved, and um, of course when they Built the old 
So there was the first station built in 56 and they had the dome which they built early 70s and now the new station which they started around uh, the turn of the um, century. Um, they kind of uh, moved the, sta the whole station layout a little bit around, but overall then the buildings itself, they stay the same distance and they are not moved. I mean, it doesn't really matter if we uh, um, write it to geographic pole or like a mile away. I mean, that doesn't really change anything much for the um, for tracking of stars or anything like that. I mean, of, of course, if you talk about longer time spans of like a few hundred years, yeah, it will eventually have an effect, effect but um, just 30 feet a year, I mean, for the next even 30, 40 years, it's, it's nothing. It's now only the 300 club gets harder for the new guys because now the geographic pole moved by the main entrance of the station. So now it's moving farther away again. So it's getting, <laughs> Basically, round trip 60 feet more every year. So <laughs> at one point, I won't be really feasible anymore to do this around the club. <laughs> Have to keep adding a few more of those uh, flags that are spaced out at 15 uh, feet, feet apart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hey, if that's it for everyone, I think we can say good night to Robert. It's the middle of the night in Germany. So I think we owe him thank you for being with us and spending the evening with us here in Ohio and uh, the eastern United States. So thank you, Robert. You're very welcome. And Matt, make sure to send out uh, two links to that um, South Pole Sky page and the Vimeo page so people can have a look at the videos. I certainly will. And good night to you. And okay. thank you very much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks to everybody for listening and all the best and stay healthy. Feeling dumb. Can it? <laughs> See ya. Good night. So long, Matt. Goodbye, Dave. We'll see you the next time. Bye, mother. <laughs>